Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Margaret Kohler. I'm the current chair of the Otterbein English Department. I know we've got numerous past chairs here, so I want to add that current. Um, I want to welcome you here today to this memorial gathering for Professor Norman Cheney. Um, I especially would like to welcome Frida Cheney and also by live stream, um, close old friends of Norman's, Joseph and Judith Mosier, who couldn't be here with us in person, but who are streaming with us today. And welcome all of you here. I wanted to just share, well, we have some speakers, but I wanted to share one quick story about Norman. Um, which is that a couple of years ago when he was kind of out a little bit and was on short-term disability, um, he recommended to me a George Orwell novel called Keep the Aspidistra Flying. And he compared himself to Aspidistra, which is apparently one of the hardiest houseplants. <laughs> I looked up <laughs> a little bit of information about it and it can withstand like hot sun, deep shade, lack of water, uh, <laughs> indoor air, even neglect, and it keeps going. So it was just a beautiful, and we I bought a copy of the Orwell novel, kind of a racy looking cover that we will have in the English suite if you would like to read. Um, but it, it, I'm so pleased to have others here to share their memories of Norman today. And let me first introduce Wendy Sherman Heckler, provost and senior vice president, who will share a few remarks about Norman. Thanks, Margaret. Um, I just wanna thank you all for joining us today. And really I come, I'm here on behalf of Otterbein University and it is my privilege to welcome you uh, to this occasion on which we celebrate the life of Dr. Norman Cheney. To call Professor Cheney an Otterbein institution would be an understatement. As you know, from the invitation to this afternoon's event, he joined the Otterbein's English department in 1964 and for more than 50 years taught early British literature, Shakespeare, creative writing, environmental literature, and courses in the integrative studies program. Countless students have passed through his classes. Countless colleagues have sought his insight and advice. And as a result, his legacy lives on at this campus. To dedicate one's life to academic pursuits means fundamentally that you will contribute to our store of human knowledge. But at an institution like Otterbein, the commitment, we are unapologetically proud of our role as educators. My colleagues know that I am fond of reminding us all from time to time that students learn what they live. In other words, students absorb what we tell them through not just our speech, but our actions and dispositions, our attitudes and proclivities. They learn via the examples of the lives that we lead, in front of, but essentially with them. And though the maxim refers to students, of course, we all learn from those with whom we surround ourselves every day. From the provost's office, I have heard many, many stories about Norm Cheney, stories of his intellect, stories of his classroom sense of humor, a very wry sense of humor, and ultimately his impact on our students, his colleagues, and our institution. And it strikes me how very fortunate we are to have lived with his example. Professor Cheney was a man of letters, but he was also known as a Renaissance man, which I imagine you'll learn more about as we will hear from his colleagues today. And while we're reminiscing about his life, we might also take a moment to reflect on our own lives. What would Norm have wanted us to exemplify for those with whom we will share our time on earth. We might do Dr. Norman Cheney no greater honor than to let his life instruct us. Thank you for being here today. Do I introduce Paul Margaret? <laughs> okay, so now I want to introduce 
Professor of English, Dr. Paul Eisenstein. Thank you. Um, so I'm obviously quite humbled to be able to speak in tribute to uh, the life and memory of Norman Cheney uh, today. Uh, Norman was the chair of the department when I first came to this campus about 25 years ago. So you never really forget your first chair. I think that's probably true. And um, he was someone just unfailingly supportive of, of me. And after about nine or 10 years here, our roles sort of reversed. I became the chair of the department and um, I got to see him teach and I got to read and understand the kinds of things that students said about his classes. And I saw firsthand how supportive he was of students and how committed he was to the cultivation of their skills as readers and thinkers. And Norman had this great line of Emerson's that he would always cite on his syllabus. It went something like this. It said, first we read, then we do other things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think <laughs> that this was Norman, the range of Norman's interests, okay, like the kind of literary text that he read with and taught to students was prodigious. Like Wendy mentioned some of the things that he taught here, classical mytho mythological works from antiquity. He taught a really popular class here called myth, fantasy, and folklore. Um, canonical works in British literature from Beowulf to Paradise Lost. He taught Shakespeare. He taught creative writing. He taught the course in linguistics that our department offers. Wendy mentioned environmental literature. I think the environmental literature course, I think, was always one especially close to his heart. And before today, I had a uh, look at a syllabus of his that I had in my files somewhere for this environmental literature course. And he organizes the course into three categories. The first category is Paradise Lost. The second category of texts are under Paradise Sought. And the third was Paradise Regained. Norman was an optimistic person, wasn't he? Uh, <laughs> lost, sought, regained, you know? And so I think he exemplified a, um, and he believed in a kind of resilience, you know? So we're gonna regain it, you know? So prodigious intellect, uh, distinguished academic pedigree, right? Uh, astonishing range of interests. He sang in the Columbus Symphony Chorus, I learned that. He flew planes. I have an exclamation point in my text here. Um, but he was also one of the most humble human beings I think you're likely to come across. And linked to this uh, humility was his sense of calmness. I was corresponding with some former colleagues, current and former colleagues, asking for some reminiscences about Norman. And this was a feature of his disposition that came up over and over again. Like when you saw him or in the hall or in his office or you spoke with him, he just carried himself with a kind of calmness and, and humility. And what gets named again and again in reminiscences of Norman uh, as maybe the source of this humility and possibly one of the reasons why he connected with some and many Otterbein students is his rural Indiana upbringing. Um, I for one have always loved the poetic surprise that one gets when one hears the two signifiers that name the place from which Norman hailed. Ready? Brazil, Indiana. <laughs> um, now, I mentioned Norman's office a few seconds ago, and a colleague wrote to me that remembering that it was the orderly study of a scholar gentleman, the scholar gentleman that he was, and how a visit there was like a trip to the library with the opportunity to discover new pleasures. And the conversations that would likely transpire there might be about literature, they might be about classical recordings of music or the screening of a vintage film or some contemporary event or Norman's work in Knox County on behalf of the environment. Someone else wrote to me of a trip out to see Norman's, quote, barn full of books. <laughs> and this person noted how that phrase, barn full of books, a little bit like Brazil, Indiana, it captures something of like erudition and like cosmopolitan qualities, but also humble rural roots, like a barn full of books. <laughs> so in the last book that he published, which is right here, it's called The Appointed Earth, uh, Norman investigates writers to whom he was drawn because they helped him, he said, uh, over years to sustain confidence in and wonder of a creation that is appointed by, or permeated with something not our own. And he lists like six or seven of the things that people use to name this something not our own, creator, God, being, presence, power, principle. And his own preferred uh, name for this something was wisdom, like with the capital W. And 
I thought like sustained confidence and wonder brought forward through a thinking about wisdom that maybe, I don't know, is there a better way to distill the contributions Norman made to this university? Um, and I guess I wanna say Norman that I think it's this confidence and wonder that we are here to celebrate and honor today. So I will now introduce my other colleague, Jeremy Smith. He can offer some reminiscences. Yeah. On the left, you see the plaque that will be set up next to Norm's former office. And it has a photo there. I hope you've taken a look at it. And there, one, there, okay. And there's a poem. And that's what I'd like to uh, read and say a little bit about that poem. Um, and this is a poem written about flying written by a pilot named John Gillespie McGee, who served in World War II and died in 1941. Norm always kept a copy of this poem displayed on his desk at home and also for a time at least on his office door at Autobahn. I should also mention that uh, Frida tells me that Norm, Norm earned his pilot's license on August 31st, 2005 I'll let you figure out how old he would have been then. <laughs> um, and that he once said that this, all of his life's achievements, was the one of which he was most proud. I don't think he meant to, anyway. <laughs> so I'd like to read this poem and say a little bit about it. Oh, I have slipped the surly bounds of earth and dance the skies on laughed silver wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred th things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or eagle ever flew. And while with silent, lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. This poem is of course literally about flying and Norm loved, literally loved flying, but the poem is more than that, as I suppose English professors would say, but it is. <laughs> the hundred things you've never dreamed of, the windswept heights, the untrespassed sanctity of space where the poet touched the face of God, this poem is also about a journey of imagination, a journey of thought, and finally a journey of spirit. And these are not the beckoning skies of progress and revolution people are likely to think of today, but of the mysteries and the profundities of being, of the permanent questions about the meaning, origin, and destiny of human life, about what nature is, about the problem of evil, about the identity of God and Jesus Christ, and finally, about how to live. My conversations with Norm were an endless exploration of the paths staked out by the explorers from the past, Plato and Aristotle, Homer and Sophocles, Augustine and Aquinas, Dante and Shakespeare, Calvin and Jonathan Edwards, Emerson and Thoreau, Schleiermacher and Karl Barth. Norm was my companion on this journey, but he was even more a guide upon this journey for generations of Otterbein students, a guide in whom they could have confidence and find the assurance, and also a guide who challenged them to soar higher than they might have thought possible. We will all miss him more than words can express.
Oh, you're still. Well, I'm done. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Jeremy, for those beautiful remembrances of Norman. I want to let everyone know that the plaque with the lovely photograph and poem will hang in the newly painted beautiful sage green suite outside of Norman's former office. Yes, it was just painted last weekend, the other suite. Um, and will look beautiful with that wall hanging. I also want to call your attention to uh, the back of your program where you can learn a little bit more. You might just want to take this home with you. You can learn a little bit more about the Norman Cheney Memorial Scholarship um, that is being fundraised for currently. And then just finally, I want to again, thank you for coming. I want to, I forgot to say this before, but I want to especially thank the alumni who have come back. I joked to Suzanne that I felt like I was on an, um, an episode of This Is Your Life, English department style, or maybe like I've died and gone to English heaven, but it's <laughs> just really nice to see these familiar faces from so many different years here. So I hope you'll stick around and talk with others and mingle and have a glass of tea or punch and a snack. But thank you again, everyone for coming.